Everyone good? Great. I know people are still getting situated, but I really want to jump right in here. So when we talk about opportunity zones and kind of the promise that they provide, which is this idea that will take areas of low income, of disinvestment, revitalize them, it'll be good for everyone, the citizens, every businesses, et cetera. This isn't the first time we've heard this, right? This isn't the first type of program here or abroad that has been piloted to attempt this. Not many of them have been particularly successful in hindsight. So I'm wondering, is there anything about opportunity zones that strikes you as different? And is there a way for them to be more successful than things have been in the past? Mayor, I'm going to start with you. Just great. Starting with me. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Randall Woodfin. I serve as mayor of the city of Birmingham. This is a very hard conversation for 30 minutes. It has some, very, it has some unique complex complexities. I'll start with just a little backdrop and try to move very um, fastly in answering the question. Um, I ran on the whole theme of putting people first and neighborhood revitalization. And so I think um, as many cons as there could be with Opportunity Zones, I actually think there are more pros if mayors actually use, one, their convening power, to understand uh, their unique access to resources. And I'm gonna define some of those resources as the ability to control zone, zoning or permitting as it relates to uh, when people um, engage in your city if they want to build something. Um, and three, I would say understanding the different silos and breaking those silos down. So as it relates to opportunity zones, um, I believe the difference between this and others is if the mayor actually, actually engages, there can be a ripple for the folks you want to serve. Now, what, is that, what does that mean? It can mean so many different things, but I think for us, we applied um, for a lot of census tracts. We got 24 of those census tracts from our governor. Those 24 census tracts literally make up one-fourth from all that were granted across the entire state, and the city made up of 99 neighborhoods that touches 77 out of 99 neighborhoods, those 24 census tracts. So there's a unique opportunity in our city if we partner with the private sector, the philanthropic community, the for-profits, the banks, the et, cetera, et cetera, have a conversation about what is it we want to see in these communities. I think it can work and not to lose the voice of the people at the same time. All right. So the mayor is an optimist, Rip. <laughs> is less of an optimist. Okay. Um, it just seems to me that this is a vehicle um, that is as unpredictable as it is powerful. I mean, whenever you implicate the tax code, you have the possibility of just moving gigantuan amounts of capital. But there's a reason these gigantuan amounts of capital haven't moved into some of our most disinvested places. And I think the mayor is absolutely right. I mean, it, w between what the mayor says and what Maurice is going to say in a moment, I mean, you have this very unusual possibility to sort of frame up investable propositions, do it in places that have not traditionally been invested in, and hope that that becomes sort of a sufficient magnet to get people to act in both their self-interest and their social interest. The problem is, I think, there, there is a reason these monies have not flown, in, uh, uh, moved, flowed into these communities. These are, they tend to be high-risk propositions. They tend to have uh, limited possibility of, of return. Um, and so I think what we have to guard against, and I think what the mayor is absolutely right to guard, have us guard against, is uh, unless these are shaped properly, the capital is going to move to relatively low risk, relatively high return projects, or relatively high return um, but safe parts of these districts. I mean, I don't know about you, but in Detroit, we have a ton of opportunity zones. And I could imagine capital landing in those zones in a way that just accelerates gentrification, accelerates good movement that's already been done. There's nothing bad about that. But I could imagine the capital really sort of demarcating itself from where we really need it, which is the really tough places. So long way of saying it, I tend to be a little bit more skeptical. I think this is a fraught vehicle. Um, and I think if the mayors and the intermediaries who work in this space can get their acts together with philanthropy, I think this could be actually an extraordinary thing. But absent that, it, it, it could be deeply disappointing. Yeah. Maurice? So I think the 
promise of Opportunity Zones is two or three, four. One, we're talking about a asset class that heretofore has pretty much been on the sidelines when it comes to community development, uh, and that's high net worth individuals. Mm -hmm. They are not investing in our communities in anything like a substantial way, uh, except for projects, maybe schools here and there. And so one big promise here is $6 trillion of capital gains that are, if you will, potentially at stake here. We've had no incentive that's even close to that. The largest community development incentive today is the Low Income Housing Tax Fund. That's $9 billion. We're talking about $6 trillion. So we've never had anything of this scale. That's number one. Second piece to think about is this is also the first incentive of scale for equity in these communities. Not loans, not debt, we're talking equity. Again, we've never had anything of this scale that is about equity. And so that's another huge promise. Now to the point that Rip was making, the bottom line though, this is the this is the, the words of the poet, right? We keep dreaming of systems so perfect that no one ever has to be good. We gotta be good for this to work, yeah. right? It will not work for the communities that we want it to work for unless local government, local philanthropy, local actors, local nonprofits are intentionally trying to make this work for the people that we want it to work for. That's the bottom line. And the other thing that I would also do is I would take exception to your hypothesis. Mm -hmm. The low income housing tax credit has built millions of affordable housing across the country. The new markets tax credit has employed hundreds of thousands of people in jobs. It's not that these programs have not worked. They've not been of the scale that you need them to work. The problems, the economy, the transformation of the economy is happening at a much more advanced speed than these small programs have been able to battle. And so I think we're wrong to say that stuff hasn't worked. It has worked. It's worked at the scales that we have actually allocated them for. I used to do economic development for the state of Virginia. We spend, bless you, $90 billion a year, $90 billion a year on incentives for companies to move into already affluent communities. $90 billion a year. Give me $90 billion for poor communities a year, and I'll show you a different result. Can I, can I add something yeah. that um, is Rip, Rip said? Because Rip, Rip has a fear of investing in already areas that are affluent. You know, these census tracts at a minimum have to be 20% poverty level. And so even if I use my city, Birmingham, for example, and I know my friend St. Louis has very similar census tracts, Birmingham has a minimum of 30% 30, um, 30 poverty right now. And that's not even, I'm not even including for um, single, um, single families where mothers right. are taking care of their children where it's at least 40%. And so from that standpoint, you know, these areas they can only put it at a minimum where there's 20% poverty rate with the census tract. And so there's already, that already leans towards positive, but it's mm -hmm. back to what he said. If mayors aren't going to drive the conversation and use that convenient power, it will fail. I wanna dig into the census tracts a little bit um, because you know, localities got back th their opportunity zones. Some of them were pleased, some of them were not. Um, and there was some skepticism across the country in different areas about areas that got chosen. Um, Rip, I'm wondering if you could weigh in a little bit about that kind of controversy and whether or not you think that the tracks were ultimately fair, equitable. Uh, it's a good question. Um, I think you know, of the 8,000 census, census tracts that were chosen, I suspect on balance we did a pretty good job. Uh, that, and I have heard some of the same criticisms that in certain parts of the country, um, it was sort of left some, something to be desired. But I think by and large, when you look at the intent of the program, it matches pretty well to the places that were chosen. And um, 
I was just trying to be a little bit provocative because I, I agree with Maurice that if these can be properly framed, um, they can provide the kind of impetus to uh, communities that it just simply hasn't been available. I, I, I just, I keep thinking of how difficult it is to put together an investable proposition in Detroit. These are very complex projects. You got to get the mayor, you got to get the private developer, you probably need some incentive from um, the philanthropic sector. Um, and every single one of those is just like pulling a weight. And unless you are really project ready under this program, you know, you've got what, 33 months to get up and going on this stuff? The, unless you've got a pipeline, it's hard for me to imagine this sort of immediate sort of rising up of a set of projects that all of a sudden no one had thought about. So it's gotta come out of the pipeline. It's gotta come out of an absorptive capacity in community. You gotta be able to deliver these projects in community. And to do that, it just seems to me that you've gotta to, got to double down on the mayor's office and on some of the most effective intermediating structures like LISC to get it done. So I wanna go back to something that Marie said, which is basically don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Um, I'm wondering what does good look like in the actual manifestation of these opportunity zones, particularly when we talk about the involvement of mayors and local government and what they need to do to make these opportunity zones work. Uh, is that for me? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, well, I think the first thing that local officials have to do is to not think of these opportunity zones in isolation, right? They should be part of your overall community and economic development plan. So the first, I think the first key to making them work is they should be integrated into your overall plan and there should be other tools that you bring to the table in order to make this work. And so one metric is not how much just the opportunity zones are bringing in, but how much other capital you're putting on the table in these zones. Remember, most of the communities that we're talking about need capital stacks that have philanthropic dollars, that have equity dollars, that have debt, that have grants. So overall investment is one piece of this. Uh, a second piece, I think, for me is what Rip was talking about, which is you really should be, at least initially, going to those places where you've got investable projects. Because that's how you're gonna socialize investors that they should be taking risk and they'll get some modest return in these places. That, in part, relies on the speed that it takes to actually get a project done. So everybody now is going out talking about these huge funds, right? We're gonna raise a $500 million fund. We're gonna, no, find a project, get an investor, bring that investor to the table. The more you can get investors quickly investing in projects in these zones, it's, it's like an effect that, that it's a domino effect. Then you can bring something larger, but we gotta start with matching an investor with a project. That's, in my mind, some of the key to making this work. He's a real expert. <laughs> Rip, did you want to I, I was just going to I was just going to punctuate the power of the, sort of the early investments that will sort of make this market. Because you have such a short window to get this money deployed, these early investments and in projects are going to signal the market in a very powerful way. And we can do that any number of ways. I suspect we're going to have a couple of huge platforms, huge funds come in and try to make a mark early on. And I, I just, I guess I would appeal, appeal to folks in the audience or otherwise who are inclined to get into this mix, not to wait for those big market makers because they will make your market for you. And if we can begin defining the kinds of investments, the kinds of investment categories, the kinds of capital stacks that Maurice described early on that takes some of these riskier projects, projects that actually hold the potential for a real social return and demonstrate to the market that you can actually get these projects done and you can use this tool in a beneficial way. I think it's gonna be hugely helpful. Okay, I wanna let the audience know that I have another question or two for our panel, but we wanna make some time for you guys to ask your own questions. So if you could start thinking about them now, 
make sure they are questions versus comments. If they are comments, you should feel free to tweet them. Um, <laughs> condense those questions all the way down, and when I call for them, just get those hands up high. There are mic runners. I am basically staring into lights, so I will not be able to see it. So, Mayor, you just heard kind of two ideas about what it will take for local leaders to really make the most of these opportunity zones. Um, I'm wondering, so what is your, what is your plan? Affordable housing. All right, I, th I think the biggest return we can get on um, opportunity zones is around affordable housing. But affordable housing has a risk that these two gentlemen know uh, much about. And if you want these investors to um, engage, you, you, need a, you need something to hook. I think the hook is the commercial development attached to um, affordable housing. So basically, mixed use. And we're working on, a, we got a couple mixed use projects and ideas we have in the pipeline right now, particularly on the western side of town where um, poverty, uh, it's not just poverty, it's concentrated poverty and all these issues around transportation or youth who are not just unemployed, they've totally stopped looking for opportunities. Um, we believe um, affordable housing attached to some form of an existing commercial district, which outside of our city's downtown, we have 25 commercial quarters, the small business districts. Uh, we believe a fusion of our these small business districts attached to affordable housing um, is the best in the queue where we can drive some of this. And so it's, believe it or not, banks would be one of the number one organizations we would engage. And it's not just through opportunity zones with these capital gains sitting on the sidelines. Right. It would be CRA as well. And so it would be a multitude of things, but we would drive it through opportunity zones. All right. I want to go to the audience for questions really quickly just to make sure we get them in. I think there's, I can kind of see, there's one right there. <laughs> oh, there's lights. Right. <laughs> Hi, uh, Brennan. I'm from Boston, uh, working with a consulting group there. And uh, one of the themes we've heard from private sector investors who are interested in moving into opportunity zones is what steps can local, state uh, governments take to you know, either build tools or make information more accessible to speed up the process? So how do local and state governments, you know, what are some of the first steps they can take to attract those you know, first or second time investors to the table? So Indianapolis is a place I would commend you to look at. They now are at the beginning of creating a portal for the city or for the region, uh, the Indianapolis region. The idea being to actually get in the portal the investable projects that people are identifying all over the city and try to match them with investors. The, the idea behind the portal is matchmaking. And so every city can do that. Every town can do that. And so I would start looking at what places like Indianapolis are doing uh, and seeing if you can replicate that. Because my sense is that information is the first real step that people need to take get that stuff in a place where investors and people in city government and nonprofit and the philanthropic community can see what projects are there and what they need to get across the finish line. I would add, and Rip is going to add something too. No, please. Um, we're creating an actual an investment advisory board. Hmm. And so it's not just... Um, it's not just a bunch of investors sitting around a table by themselves saying, this is what we're going to go do. As mayor, with that, quote, convening power, we're creating an investment advisory board, but we're also creating a citizen's um, advisory board where all parties can talk to each other to say um, citizens and residents in a, a low-income low area where there is needs. What are those needs? Is it affordable housing? Um, what is it? to the particular investors, what is it that you all have some ideas around and marrying those two? Rip, you had a comment? With just a, sort of a variation on the theme. Um, for those of you who are interested, Bruce Katz at, the, at Drexel University has come up with an investment prospectus that he's used in Los Angeles and a handful of other communities that tries to get 
local government to think like an investor. I mean, really build up your case. What are the investable, not just what are the projects you're interested in, what do you think is investable, but what does the capital stack look like? Where do you need certain kinds of capital to fill certain kinds of gaps? And it just seems to me that that's sort of the first step municipal government can take because you got to get in the room um, 110 projects. I mean, you were saying earlier, Mayor, that you know, you're going to throw as much as you can up against the wall. And while I think that's a good idea, I also think that if you're thinking like an investor, you want to see four things that you could actually move money into tomorrow morning. And, you, and my money needs to do this, 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 and this. It needs to be surrounded by this kind of regulatory relief. It has to, you know, the whole deal. And I think that it's going to be hard for communities to pick and choose. We were in Cleveland. Kresge was in Cleveland a month or two ago. And the entire conversation among 150 community representatives was how do we prioritize our investments? Who makes the call? Is it the mayor? Is it the local CDC? Is it the local community? Is it the Cleveland Clinic? And I think communities one by one by one have really got to do exactly what you've suggested. They've got to figure out how they can sit down around a table, figure out how they might prioritize, um, how they might make these selections, and then sort of go to market the way an, any investor would want to see you go to market. All right, I think we had a question. We had a bunch right here in the middle. Say I'm mayor of the city of Patterson. Randall, good job. You represented us very well. <laughs> so we're still waiting for the regulations to finally be fleshed out. Do we have any idea when that may occur? So they're out. They came out. I must uh, have missed that memo. Yeah, they came out last Thursday, last Friday. Uh, so you better get on that website there, mayor. <laughs> 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 right. There's a 60-day comment period. Um, but they're out now. You can see... Um, what Treasury has done. I, I would tell you from an investor perspective, the ranks look pretty pretty decent. Uh, if you were looking for guardrails, you won't be happy, right? There aren't any of those, but, but they're out and you can get them on the website. All right, I think there was another one right there. Good afternoon, thank you. I'm Antonio Locke. I have a question about community and getting the community involvement to participate in the investments, right? So everybody talks about crowdfunding. What's your experience in potentially putting that as part of the capital stack on top of the opportunity zone and allowing for the neighbors to be able to invest in, 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 in properties around them and see some of the returns and feel the ownership of what's going on in their neighborhood and potentially make that happen? Mayor, you look eager to respond. So in my in, in the city of Birmingham, we have very similar housing issues like Detroit. Uh, right at sixty percent of our housing stock is houses thirty years thirty years or more that are older. And so there hasn't been a lot of new development. And for those existing homeowners, it's really about how to take care of them and make sure they're not they're not priced out, or from a gentrification standpoint, totally pushed out. And so I think part of the conversation with the residents on the front end is participating in a current tool. So if, we're, if, we're, if this table represents a toolbox, Opportunity Zones is one of the tools that we think is, is it's a hammer. But another tool within this toolbox is also the land bank. And so how do you literally marry the two conversations where existing residents whether it's their existing home can participate in programs where there's funding to bring their houses up to code or an empty lot or a side lot that they can purchase and make sure um, that whatever, whatever option comes available on that lot, they're right there at the table to participate in that. All right, I think we had another one right there. Hi, uh, my name is Chris. I'm from Miami, Florida. Uh, we have 68 uh, Opportunity Zone census tracts in our county alone. Um, and to the community's credit, we're really mobilizing um, around trying to get out ahead of this and get out in front of it. Um, unfortunately, what it feels like is that we're running and kind of chasing our tails. Mm -hmm. And there's a pretty significant information gap between the people who have been working in community and really trying to support these communities and the investors that are kind of coming in and kind of are a little bit more savvy and have more expertise with this. My biggest concern, one of the reasons why I'm a little bit more bearish on this, is just that without some kind of substantial philanthropic capital or something coming in to help us elevate our thinking and how uh, we're able to at least get level with the knowledge of the investors, 
our communities are going to end up being taken advantage of just because we're not able to kind of get ahead of it. So I was wondering, from your standpoint, is there anything that you're looking into or resources that we can use um, both in like locally but across the country in places so that we don't get taken advantage by more savvy investors? Um, about a month and a half ago, Kresge and the Rockefeller Foundation went out to market with essentially an RFP to opportun potential opportunity funds, said, just send us your ideas. I mean, what are you thinking about, uh, whether it's in Miami or Birmingham? We got back about 150 um, proposals. And of those 150, I would say 20 are real. These folks really don't know what they want to do, how they want to do it, how they relate to community, how they relate to a mayor's office. And so one of the things we've done very simply is to take 20, which we felt had some real potential, and ask them to essentially accept some coaching on this. How do you work with municipalities? And then try to create some mechanisms for exactly that kind of bridging that you're talking about. I, I think you would be surprised that the level of investor sophistication is not as high as you think. They may have some ideas about where they want to move their money, but how to land that in Miami or again in Birmingham, I think they don't know very well. And they're going to need Sherpas. They're going to need folks who can actually guide them on the ground to the kinds of projects or priorities or systems that they need. And so you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I think one of the first things we need to do is get philanthropy in the mix, who, particularly local philanthropy, who can provide some discretionary capital for you guys to develop a prospectus and for the investor class to sort of get maybe a little bit more sophisticated about how these deals actually get put together. We hope investors will use organizations that are already investing in these zones. So my organization has already invested $2.5 billion in opportunity zones around the country. We hope that investors will get wise and realize just like they do on the rest of their investments, if they want to make a return, they ought to go to the experts. Um, that's our hope. Uh, we also fear that there's going to be some bad stuff happening. And I think that's what Rip was alluding to. We got to make sure that on the local level, that as you're thinking about the investments, you're also simultaneously thinking about, for example, anti-displacement strategies. You have to have those both on the table from day one, we think, in order to make this work for the people we want it to work for. Yeah, go ahead. In Miami, who applied? Who, who sent the census tracts request to the governor? So in Birmingham, we did it. The mayor's office did it. We chose the census tracts we wanted to send to the governor. Did we get every census tract we want? No. But we got majority of what we wanted. That alone tells us we're in a driver's seat to drive this conversation. Um, are, do we have concerns about investors wanting to do whatever they want to do without um, or overlooking what fits or marries that potential neighborhood? Yes. But there are certain things mayors have to do in their position as it relates to representing all people to make sure that doesn't happen. All right. I think that's where we're going to stop. Thank you so much for your time. Please join me in thanking our panel.